God is good. And all the time. If you're not with my friends, you can see them screen behind me. Uh, first of all, there are prayer cards in the pews. Um, if you um, have a prayer request, please go one out. Private prayer request means that it's for my eyes only. Public prayer request means that we pray for each other as you can find inside the program. There are also visitor cards as well there. If you're a guest, we'd love for you to pull one of those out. Just drop those cards off in the offering plate at that time of the service. There's a youth group tonight. We'll be meeting on the 20th in the evening to be talking through about what we'll do in the, um, for the spring, probably fall. Good morning, George. What we'll do in the fall here for the youth group. So that'll be on the 20th. I want to say, change. We'll let those youth who are involved let them know when the time comes. Sunday school for our kids is off for the summer. Um, instead of some kind of preparation, uh, for Sandra and our, and our leaders for Sunday school, so we'll start back up in September. Marvelous Mondays will begin in the middle of September as well. If you're interested in helping with the last field, especially for the, the meal for that Tuesday night, August 15th, sign up sheet outside of the church office, which is downstairs, more or less across the hall from the ladies' restroom. Just sign up there if you're willing and able to help provide meals for those who will be collecting and harvesting. You know, the crops at the Boaz field, where those crops can go to local food pantries, including our own Boaz and Fishes. And you may have seen last week that we had the uh, dog tags. Well, the problem is, as friends, we ran out of dog tags. What a great pain. I ordered 200 dog tags with the point on them. You can't really see it up there on the screen, but it says who I am and then the cross. The point being this, who am I? Who am I? Ultimately, just like with those in the military, who am I? I'm saved by God's grace. That's why we have the dog tag. Well, if you're interested in a dog tag, since we ran out this morning, I don't know if people are selling them on eBay or what. <laughs> Either way, if you're interested, let me know. I know how to get more of them. Just let me know if you're interested, okay? I'm not going to order them. If you don't let me know, but please let me know. If we have a few people who are interested, we will get more. If it's that worthwhile, because if we went through, we only had 160. Probably 125 people in worship last Sunday, and we ran out. That tells me that this is something that's helpful. So we'll get more, and you just need to let me know. Friends, does it make sense? Let me know. Otherwise, we only greet one another with the love of Christ. that he would see that plan come 
true.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and dead in the earth. And the third day he arose from the dead, he ascended to heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. For the next he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. My friends, please be seated.
guys ever play musical chairs? Uh huh. All right, we're gonna play musical chairs right here, right now. Okay, ready? Whenever you, we're gonna play music, and whenever it stops, you have to grab a spot on the floor because instead of musical chairs, we play musical spots. Okay. You guys ready for this? Here we go. Fantastic. All right, who's missing the spot? Who's missing the spot? Gary, do you have a spot? Bingo. Riley, do you have a spot? Bingo. No, you don't have to sit down, Riley. All right, let's try it again. Maybe I just messed up here. Go ahead, Gary. Let's do this again. Go ahead.
Gladys, and not be like some other, other men here or push kids out of the way. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for making out of joy and fun here. Thank you that unlike musical chairs, musical spots, there's always a spot for us at your table. What a gift, because we don't deserve it. But it's in Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. And so, ladies, here we have. I've got your juice boxes. I have here great peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. If you like them, grab a couple. Or Captain Waker, Captain Wafers, grilled cheese if you like them. Plus the great juice. Juice. Okay. Grab a couple of them and crack them. What do you guys like? Thank you. You're welcome, camera. <laughs> or none. <laughs> Ronnie, you want more than one? Nothing for Ron. Seriously, nothing? I want to look at you now. <laughs> Friends, what would you like to give God thanks for this morning? What would you like to praise God for who God is? What do we need to be praying for? Bob? I think we need to pray for grandparents. <laughs> Dare I ask for how they may cheat at games? Or? Well, how they take care of all the grandchildren when the parents need to go somewhere. And uh, yeah. Kathy takes it as crazy with the son of a baseball game. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Friends, anything else we need to be praying for? Anything else we need to thank God for? Praise God for who God is. Clint? We should pray for the family of Brendan Wright. We pray for Reverend Rice. Okay. Thanks, Marianne. I want to say thank you, Lord, and everybody who prayed for the Lord for my nephew Alex. He went out of the hospital this week after nearly dying, and we know prayer was involved. And I want to thank the Lord and you folks for praying for Ben and Sam. Traveling where he got back from Mexico, and Ben's two days into his three-day trip home now. And I want to thank the Lord for getting Kate into her new house, etc., etc., etc. There's all sorts of things. <laughs> so thank God for Kate Renee's new house, Ben and Sam making Sam making it safely from New Mexico back to Mexico. Party, let alone keep praying for Finley as he's on his way back from Mexico. And also, praise be to God for Alex and the healing of Marianne's nephew. What a gift. Okay. Thanks, Marianne. Friends, is there anything else we need to be praying for? We want to thank God for Denise. Prayers for all those that were in abstinence this week. That seems to be a lucky week. And um, for those moments that Jesus takes the wheel, we're very thankful for this. One of those both passages, and they seem to have happened quite a bit this week, too. Denise mentioned also, thanks be to God for those moments where Jesus takes the wheel. Kathy? Um, we had a friend, Chad Bayhay, that lives in Ohio. Uh, we prayed for him before for cancer operation that he mm -hmm. had on his colon. And it had mastitis to his liver. They have not seen any signs, and they thought he had a They're going to be Okay. So be praying for, I'm sorry, Kathy, I cut you off. His name's Chad. Chad A. All right, so be praying for Chad A. Thank you. There's colon cancer, and it's past the size, and it's now in his liver. Friends, is there anything else? Joanne. I had a call to get down to the Ringer House the other day, and believe you me, they need our prayers and our concern. Okay. All right, so we're praying for the, the Ringer family as well. Also, we're praying for Patty and his family as um, we had Patty's funeral service on Friday. Uh, so we look at Patty and his family. Friends, is there anything else? Then why don't we go to the Lord together for prayer? Father, thank you that there is a spot at the table that unlike the musical chairs when we play the game, 
there's always this block for us. We don't deserve to be at the table. We haven't earned our way there. It's not like we can afford the ticket to make the price to be at the table. One day, the, the table to celebrate the Lord's Supper here on earth, let alone this, the hints of this banquet in heaven that will occur. And yet, you've opened up the door. We don't deserve it, but you've opened up the door. It's by your grace and your, your, your kindness to us that you allow us to have a spot at the table. Talk about love that you have for us. For those of us who have failed you in multiple ways, how we turned our backs on you, how we, how we pretended we haven't known you and only put on the side of the time when we do know you. And yet, you still have a spot at the table for us. For the sin, hidden secret sins that we have, for those things we've done in the past we still can't seemingly forgive ourselves for, you allow us to sit at the table. <clears throat> Too often we've been like Judas where we betrayed you. We've been like Peter where we said we didn't know you at all. We've run and hidden from something you'd have us do just like most of the disciples did. Or we've hidden behind other people like John. Sounds like he hid at the cross. But we failed you. And yet you still love us and allow us to see you at the table. Thank you, Father, there is a spot for us. We thank you, Father, for we've seen your hand at work. And it shows us you love us. What a gift it is. For safety for Finn and Sam as they drove to Mexico. And we pray for travel mercies for Finley as he drops back from Mexico. We lift before you and thank you, Father, for came and in the new house. We praise you for the findings and all that, let alone the fact that they're able to move in. What a gift. We thank you, Father. And as Incredible healing in Alan, Alex, Mary Ann's nephew. We give you thanks, Father. What a gift. Father, we're thanking you for how you bless grandparents to be able to be with their grandkids. We also pray for strength because it can be exhausting being in that parental babysitter role. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Father, for those moments where you, Jesus, you take the wheel. We give you thanks for those moments where you take over. And yet, we also ask you of those who have been involved in accidents this week. We pray for Jan A. We're praying, Father, for him in healing in the midst of the metastasized cancer to his liver. We look before you, the Ringer family. Father, we look before you, Brennan Wright's family. We're asking for you to go more. That should be with Patty and his family as well. So we come before you, Father. Knowing that you hear us, how we know you actually have a spot for us at the table. What a gift it is. Talk about love that you have for us. So we thank you and praise you as we pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Friends, the scripture reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 22. Morning, morning. If you want to read from over there, great. If you want to read here, great. Wherever you feel like reading. If you want to make it more difficult for you, you can read down there too if you want. <laughs> That's okay. You're thinking I made it difficult, huh? Yeah. You're welcome, Bonnie. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Luke 22, verses 14 to 20. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I will tell you, I will not eat it again until I find fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Friends, it's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. If you're able, let's stand together.
Who am I? I have a spot at the table. My identity as a Christian is tied to the fact that I actually have a spot at the table. I mean, we are made in the image of God. No one ever made in the image of God, but we're also affected by the fall. We're Adam and Eve ate of the fruit. And worse is how everything changed. We're affected by the fall, and in part because of the fall and our own choices, we continue to sin. We are sinners in need of grace. And thanks be to God that we are also folks who were sinners, who continue to sin, but are saved by grace. And part of the indication of that grace that God has shown us is this, that we have a spot at the table. You normally don't let your enemies sit at your table, unless it's a 23rd Psalm. Normally you don't sit down with folks who are haphazard meals and you don't care about them. And instead, we get a spot at the table. We get to celebrate the Lord's Supper in memory of and in some spiritual ways with Jesus today. What a gift. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God for Jesus. Thanks be to God that we have a spot at the table. Who am I? I'm someone who has a spot at the table. Who am I? I'm someone who has a spot at the table. In, in, in ancient the Palestinian period, before and during Jesus' lifetime, table spots were precious. Why do I say that? In, in that time period, they only ate two meals a day. One would be for a breakfast meal, which they actually called dinner. I don't get it. It was breakfast, but they called it dinner. And then they had supper, which guess what? Was dinner or supper time or dinner time. Is that anything more difficult for you? You're welcome. Dinner, which was breakfast, was anywhere from 9 to 12 noon. If you're a day laborer, which meant that every day you hoped you got a job, which was most people, then you probably ate earlier or possibly on the job. The better if you are off financially, the later in the day you would eat. 9 a.m. is when breakfast would start until around 12 noon, somewhere in there. It was a light meal. Bread, fruits, and cheeses. It was sort of like a la carte that we may have today. So, of course, you can't do the Belgian waffles if you're at the hotel. <laughs> Meanwhile, supper, which was dinner time, although it wasn't called dinner, it was called, guess what, supper. Their dinner, although I'm going to call dinner, but it was supper. Is there, you're looking at me confused. Don't worry, I can keep doing this if you like. Supper was much more. This was the meal of the day. It may not be best for those of us who think about losing weight, but for them, this was the big meal of the day. Why? Because it was cooler. Finally, the heat was gone. It dissipated. What was inside the homes were, although they were cooler inside than outside, the heat could still permeate the home. Or if you were outside, the heat could be oppressive. Hence, where they would eat that large meal at the end of the day, around 8 o'clock. That's what you'd eat. It was a time to celebrate and be together. It was a time where family caught up. Where you celebrate what you did for the day, and you grumble what may have happened, but you spent that time together. But at the supper, which of course for us would be dinner, it was um, a relaxed atmosphere with meat, vegetables, butter, wine were consumed. That's what I found in one spot. There are more items we'll talk about in a little bit here. But this was a time where you would make sure you sat together. Except for their meals, they didn't have a nice table. Not at all. They didn't have this set up at all. That was more for our viewing pleasure this morning. You would sit on the floor. Before Jesus came around, the ancient Jews would just sit on the floor. There was nothing else besides between you and the floor except for maybe part of the table. And for them, the table, at least in the um, before Jesus' time, was pretty much something akin to a tablecloth made out of animal skin or possibly woven together, laid on the floor with cords around it so that when the meal was over, you just sort of zipped it up, you had all your leftovers inside the, the bag, and you shake it out outside. So when you may do it with a tablecloth at home, when the guests leave, you grumble about who made a mess on the floor, you wrap it all together and take it outside and shake it out. That's what they would do. Seemingly later on, it became a little bit of a more gray setting. But if you've seen those pictures of Jesus at the Last Supper, they're all sitting at that nice big tall table. Most likely, they didn't have a table like that. At best, they were very close to the floor, where they would recline on pillows. It talks about John's Gospel about how John was leaning up against Jesus, although in John's Gospel, John's pseudonym for himself was the disciple whom Jesus loved. They leaned against each other because how would you sit? Don't tell my mom I sat like this at the table. But in the ancient world, you would literally lean with your left hand on the table while you ate with your right hand. Now, of course, they didn't have cellophane gra 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 crackers in those days, but we do today. That would be about it. And then you'd sit here, lean with one hand, eat with the other. Because there was no nice chair to sit on. 
There were no armrests. At best, what you had was the person next to you, or you lean on your arm. So when you sit at the table, you spend that time with each other. What's fascinating is they have what they call sop. Now, I've had this in an Ethiopian restaurant. Sop is, and so the phrase comes from you want to sop off the juice. Sop used to be the ancient utensil. Sort of like, a, at least the Ethiopian restaurant I was in, it was sort of like a, a spongy pita chip or whatnot, except it wasn't hard, it was very soft. The sop would be bread, maybe um, unleavened bread, as we may celebrate with a, a word supper. So it looks like pita bread. And you would take that and you'd dip it into your soup or your other vegetable or your dip or whatever it might be and eat that way. The only time it sounds like utensils were used was at special feasts, and that's a spoon. They didn't have forks, they didn't use those, they didn't have knives, they didn't use those. Knives may have been used to cut meat and whatnot, but at the table, which had the sock, the bread, or my five-fingered fork right here, which if you've ever watched a one or two-year-old eat, you know that this is quite effective for food. Maybe not so effective, of course, afterwards when you try to clean the mouth off, but that's another thing entirely. I will not destroy Mia and her eating prowess publicly. Although I guess you can guess the hint there. Either way, you would have your sock, you would spend that time at the table. They had plentiful, plentiful varieties and options at meals. Beef, goats, sheep, all those sort of meats would be eaten. Milk was a very important part of their diet. They would use cheese and butter. Butter seems to be along the lines of what we have now, but they still can't understand what cheese looked like in that time period. It sounds more like it would be like the curds from cottage cheese is what they would call cheese compared to what we would think, you know, sliced or you know, American cheese or whatever out of the refrigerator. Theirs was much more basic. Honey was a huge part of their diet, as were beans, legumes, um, millet, Grains such as wheat and corn would be used quite a bit. Vegetables were important as well. Almonds and pistachios were a large part of their diet. Cucumbers sound like they were a huge part of their diet, which surprised me. I didn't think they would survive in that arid culture or arid climate that they did. Fruits, well named. Although we read about the apple in the, in the Bible, it's probably more of a citron than an apple, per se, because apples technically do not grow in that part of the world. But we translate citron and apple. Otherwise, they have pomegranates, they have figs, they have dates. What are we going through all this? The meal could be a, a plentiful event. You would have plenty at the table to share. It was a time to celebrate, spend that time together with each other. As you leaned on each other, as you were forced to deal with each other, as you would share the bread, because it's not as though they had nice little cut pieces. The only time you had separate pieces was, if you were Jewish, was for the Passover. Matter of fact, the only time you ever had separate cups often was at the Passover meal. Cups were very expensive relative to today. One of the fascinating things that Jesus did for the Lord's Supper is that he actually had the communal cup where they shared together. He poured the wine. We use juice here, but juice was not available for them. It didn't come about the late 1700s to early 1800s. There was no such thing as juice otherwise. Instead, they had wine. For the Lord's Supper, Jesus had them use a communal cup. The fascinating thing is, is that if you were actually participate in a Jewish Passover, Everyone would have four separate cups for the Passover meal, just like we celebrated before our Monday, Thursday meal and last April. Four separate cups, three separate pieces of bread. But not like Jesus did it. He changed things up. One, he had the Passover meal on Thursday. We should have the Passover meal on Friday. He changed things up. Changed things up so that everybody shared from the loaf itself. They broke off pieces. In other words, it became, this is my body. Normally, we separate. Instead, you had to talk and be with other people. They shared the juice, or I should say, shared the wine. One cup. When again, the Passover meal would have four. For the Lord's Supper, Jesus even makes it more so a community event. Meals in that time period were a community event. You got together with your family, or special guests came. Being with Jesus for the Passover, where he celebrated the Lord's Supper, it was one cup, meaning it was even more a community event. It's even more that we're all in 
this together. It means even more that we are one body, that there is a spot for you. They share the same loaf. We're often at least separate pieces, all tied together. In that time period, hospitality was a hugely important thing to practice, and yet it was a dangerous thing to practice as well. If you remember the parable of the Good Samaritan, what would often happen is there were thieves who roamed in the wilderness. The wilderness wasn't what we may think of with a lot of trees. It was more of a scrub grass, dry, barren area where you took sheep out there and hoped they could survive. It was rough. When the Good Samaritan in that parable, when he's walking, the hint would be that his life was at risk when the thieves came to take him out. That would be a normal experience at that time period. It would be one thing to invite neighbors over or friends, and especially family, because family was so important. But it was a risk to practice hospitality. Should you? Yes, you are almost implored to, and yet, just because we're implored to do something, doesn't mean we often do it. At that time period, hospitality, one of those things you should do, was often not done. And yet there's Jesus. The disciples who would betray him, the disciples who would run away, the disciples who would renege on their promises. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you, said Peter, and the rooster crows. And he still ate the meal. All the apostles he ate the meal with them. All twelve, although it sounds like Judas slept somewhat through the Passover meal. So at least eleven of the twelve disciples were still in the room with Jesus for the Lord's Supper. For this time together, Who do you invite over for a meal? Who do you invite to a meal? Now, of course, if you don't do the cooking, it's a little dangerous to invite somebody over for a meal, isn't it? I sometimes get that look. You did what? Yes, dear. Or better yet, whenever I was a kid, I said, Mom, he's coming over for dinner. What did you do? Who do you not invite for a meal? And yet, for the Lord's Supper, it's not about do I want them here, do I not want them there? All are invited. Remember, if Jesus spent that time with people who deserve him, run away, he sure sounds like they don't deserve to be with him, and he still ate with them. What does it tell us? Judas, who would betray him, is at the table and they share bread. There's a spot for everyone at the table, is what it tells me. Everyone. Here in this church, you don't have to be a member. And yet, what it looks even more so is that Jesus is saying, all are invited. We may want to keep people out. And yet, Jesus sought out folks like tax collectors, sinners, bedtime with women who were or had been prostitutes. Jesus appeared after he rose from the dead. He appeared to the Apostle Paul, who was known for murdering Christians. Anyone. It's an open table. Everyone has a spot. You and I would maybe get uncomfortable with that. Good, if you are. Because everyone has a spot at the table. Who are we to keep someone out? The worst part is, and the scary part is, is we do things as Christians to keep people away. We try to act like we have our acts all together, as though somehow we're perfect. What a lie. If I'm saved by grace, that tells me that I'm only good enough to get in heaven because of what Jesus did. Why would we pretend to be something else? Or we act like folks ought to shake up before they come to the table. But somehow mm, you smell like cigarettes. Or don't you know how to get a shower? Or you shouldn't do that behavior. Or I can't hear you saying those words here. They may not be appropriate. But how many of us do some of those things or things like it in the privacy of our own home? There's a spot for everyone at the table. You may say, yeah, but there can't really be one for me. Look at how bad I am, or what I've been in the past. Well, as we talked about for the last month or so, about what's our identity, we, we've been getting at the idea that, one, we're created and we are made in the image of God. What's that tell me? I'm made in the image of God. Remember how this goes? First of all, they totally flop. So here's your hint. Repeat after me. I am made in the image of God. I am made in the image of God. I am valuable. I am valuable. I'm not junk. I'm not junk. Or 
I like to say, I ain't no junk. I mean, have to say that. It's <laughs> double negative. We're sort of saying that, hey, I am junk, but you know, I'm double negative aside. Think about it. We are made in God's image. When God looked at human beings on the sixth day, He said they were very good. We look at the mirror and we go, oh my, wrinkles, oh my, gray hair, oh my. Let alone what else we may think. Oh my, what did I do? I have those mirror moments where it's like, Brian, did you really do that? You know what I'm talking about? And God looks, and in spite of how we fail, we made the image of God and said it is very good. So we need to repeat it again for how high suicide rates are amongst teens and how terrible drug, the drug addiction seems to be. And in part that's related to the fact that, that we have lost sight of the fact that we have value and worth because we were made in God's image. So here we go again. I made the image of God. I made the image of God. Oh, a time out here, folks. Y'all are looking for me. God. I want to get through this and get home. Seriously, who wants to watch the Pirates today anyhow? My goodness, if that's what you're going home for. She, wow, it's not worth your time. Let's get on our boat. We'll find out now. Think about it. You're made in the image of God. I am made in the image of God. I am made in the image of God. I am valuable. I am valuable. I'm not junk. I'm not junk. I hope you own it. And yet, the, the terrible thing is, is the, when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit and Greater than the fact that you may not believe in that whole fruit eating thing. I do, but if you don't, here's the real important part. The way it was supposed to be is not the way it is now. The way it was supposed to be is there was no illness, there was no sickness, there was no pain. Work was easy. And they were able to be naked in front of each other and they didn't have any shame and they got to walk with God face to face. Now, we've got shame, not just by what our bodies may look like, but we have shame by what we've done. They had no shame. It was gone. There was no death. There was no illness. There were no pains. There was no aches. Work was easy and a joy. And they got to walk with God face to face. There was no separation. There was no doubting. They knew God sounded his footsteps and came through the garden. The fall changed everything from what it should have been to what it is now. So we have a fall, and with a fall, we are now affected and infected with sin. Where we we sin the way we shouldn't sin, or do things we shouldn't do, and then also don't do what we should do. And yet also sin works on us to attack us. Sort of like we talked about with Pig Pen, the, uh, the guy from the Charlie Brown comics. External, dirt, and yet if you breathe it in, it's internal as well. That's how sin works on us. Except Scripture is almost described as though it's also a living thing within us, causing us to want to do what we shouldn't do. Or as we read from Romans chapter 7, the good I want to do, I don't do, and what I keep doing, that I don't want to do. Read through 7, verses 18 and on. It's pretty convoluted. Or, if you like Christian music, listen to Skillet's Monster. That's the song that seems to get out of well, too. Sin's in us. And because of sin's in us, I'm a sinner who needs grace. Thanks be to God, I'm a sinner who is saved by grace, as we talked about last week, when we got into this whole identity we have, the hints being with the dog tags. That, guess what? I'm saved by grace. Salvation, it's a gift. Yes. It's not a faith. Well, I'm telling you, I don't know what was going on with the 9 o'clock group. They were sleeping on me. Man, 11 o'clock, we're saved by grace. We celebrate that today with what Jesus did on the cross for us. His body was broken. His blood was shed. We go through the motions at the time of the Lord's Supper, which is unfortunate and too bad. And yet there are churches where they're seeing God do incredible things through them when they celebrate the Lord's Supper every week. It's not about how often we celebrate the Lord's Supper. You know why we not only why the Lord's Supper becomes boring or becomes routine? I need to look in the mirror. Because you and I, we let it become routine. He died for us. And instead of excluding us from the table, your ticket's paid for. I've got a spot reserved for you. Valentine's Day, don't worry about it. There's still a spot for you at my table. You don't have to worry about getting a reservation. There's a spot for you. There's a spot for me. Because of what Jesus did. Now, as you leave here today, you need to be reminded of the fact that not everyone has a spot at the table. The spot's waiting for them, but they haven't come to get it. So your assignment for this week is to do this. Pray for someone you can invite to share at the table. I don't need this more supper, though. I hope you get the idea that it's about folks knowing Jesus Christ. And we really grasp what Jesus did for us. We really grasp this incredible love of God. 
We said, we do good for us, bad love of God. How can we keep it possible? Who am I? I'm just going to shake my grace, but there's a spot on the table. It defines who I am. Part of my identity is the fact that I get to celebrate the Lord's Supper with Jesus Christ. Spiritually today, here, the bread doesn't become the body of Jesus in our minds. The juice or the wine wouldn't physically become his body. But God does something spiritually in the midst of the celebration. So there's a spot for you and I. Let's celebrate the Lord's Supper today. It defines who we are. We're made the image of God. We are folks who are affected by the fall. We are Christians who continue to sin, and yet we are saved by grace. And part of that realization, the incredible grace, is this. There's a spot for us at the table. Who am I? I'm one who has a spot at the table. Who are you? You're one who has a spot at the table. Amen and amen. Friends, would you pray with me? I encourage you as we pray, throw your hands towards the heavens, we have time. Close your eyes. You can read the prayer on the screen if you like. I'm encouraging you to pray. And so, my friends, let's pray. Lord God, loving Father. Lord God, loving Father. I love you. I love you. Thank you for my spot at the table. Thank you for my spot at the table. Thank you for Jesus' body broken for me. Thank you for Jesus' body broken for me. Thank you for Jesus' blood shed for me. Thank you for Jesus' blood shed for me. Show me who to invite. Show me who to invite. Oh, thank you for that spot at the table. I pray for that spot at the table. I pray in Jesus' name. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, let's continue to worship through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. Yeah, I know. I got it out of order. We'll just keep carrying on. It won't be the last time I make a mistake. I'm just impressed with these guys.
instead of carrying off one another hand for another smile. And instead, let us pray as we ask God for forgiveness. Let's pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be in the church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved you. Friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were sinners. That proves God's love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. And all together, the glory is to God. Amen. Amen. Friends, would you pray with me? Father, we ask you to bless the bread, and may it be the body of Jesus for us. We ask you to bless the juice, and may it be the blood of Jesus for us. We ask you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Friends, the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread that was before him and he broke it, saying, this is my body, broken for you. Whenever you eat of it, remember me. So let us celebrate together as we partake of the body of Jesus together. <laughs> And that same night, Jesus took wine as before him, and poured it, saying, This is my blood shed for you. It's the cup of forgiveness, which means we have this new relationship between ourselves and God. One day, so what Jesus did on the cross, not what we do. Let's celebrate together.
Now we've come to forgiveness. The blood of Jesus shed for us. Let's drink together. And before we pray, we live in this hand sanitizer. We wash our hands before every meal we're all. And yet, if we do that today, you took a risk today. Who knows that person next to you if they washed their hands recently? Who knows what if they sneezed on it before you got to it? We take a risk. Doesn't that sound a little scary? Some of you never want to have communion again. Don't look at it that way. Look at it this way. You're a family. You have a spot at the table. We take little risks because being together is worth it so much more. He paid the price for us. And so, my friends, let's pray together. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to be ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And my friends, let us sing together as our communion stewards collect the cups. Let's sing together. We'll need to turn our hymnals in number 723. We've had a blip with the program this morning, so it will not be on the screen. So the hymnals, page number 723, verses 1 and 3. Be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you because he has blessed you in this spot. May he 